Hello everyone and um, welcome to this amazing event which I've been looking forward to for so long you wouldn't believe, probably years in fact. Um, I'm really really pleased to welcome you to um, an evening, well an interview and a reading from Rosie Garland. Uh, Megan Taylor who is one of our amazing local authors um, and uh, I think I first met Megan at a workshop at the University of Nottingham and she came in and she just really inspired the whole class um, with her writing process and by being so generous in sharing it. Um, I don't know how many of you know Megan but she writes the most incredible sort of spooky, gothic, strange, weird fiction. She's had um, four novels, three novels, can't remember. Four novels. Four novels and a couple of short story collections published and she's won. One short story <laughs> collection. <laughs> I'll get but there I'm in the end. I'll get there in the one. end. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I did tell you I hadn't realised this. <laughs> no, that's all great. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to disappear and hand over to Megan, who is, is going to talk to Rosie on our behalf and you won't be able to see me fangirling in the background. So um, I hope you have a lovely time and yeah, enjoy. And over to you, Megan. Thank you so much, Pippa, and thank you, fabulous Five Leaves, as always. I am, um, it's a real privilege to have been asked to interview the amazing Rosie Garland. Um, and for probably a lot of you here, she doesn't need any introduction, but I'm going to give her one anyway. <laughs> so, um, Novelist, poet and singer with post-punk band The March Violets, Rosie Garland has a passion for language nurtured by public libraries. Her work has appeared in Under the Radar, The North, Spelk, Rialto, Butcher's Dog, Ellipsis, New Welsh Reader, Mislexia and elsewhere. Rosie's debut novel, The Palace of Curiosities, was nominated for both the Desmond Elliott and Polari First Book Prize and Vixen was a Green Carnation Prize nominee. Her latest novel, The Night Brother, is described by the Times as a delight, playful and exuberant with shades of Angela Carter. Rosie is inaugural writer in residence at the John Rylands Library in Manchester. And in 2019, she was selected by Val McDermott as one of the 10 most compelling LGBTQI plus writers working in the UK. She's going to be talking to us tonight about um, her latest poetry collection, among other things, What Girls Do in the Dark. And um, welcome, Rosie, and thank you so much. And I will hand over to you before I ask you some questions so that we can hear some of your wonderful writing. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan. Oh, am I here yet? Hello. Yes, you're here. I'm there. Fantastic. Right. How absolutely lovely to be here tonight. And uh, it really is a joy to be at a Five Leaves bookshop event. Um, it's such a shame that I can't be there in person yet, but one day, one day I will manage to get there in person. So, right. Uh, Rosie Garland, where do I begin? Um, OK, well, I'll, I'll begin by saying, yes, I have there's my first novel, Palace of Curiosities, not one novel, I feel like The Count on Sesame Street, but two novels. There's my second novel, Vixen, three novels, my third novel, The Night Brother. And tonight I'm largely going to be talking about my new collection with the wonderful people at Nine Arches, What Girls Do in the Dark. And, you know, it's altogether fabulous to wave copies of books at people and go, there's the books. Um, what um, might be less well known is how you get there. And um, in terms of how I got there, um, it was a long and very tangled road. Um, and I, I just want to share the very brief version, just because um, just because the path to publication isn't always what you read in the newspapers, um, I took, before I got that first um, debut novel, um, Palace of Curiosities published, I'd actually written four novels, um, it, which, and, and the fourth was The Palace of Curiosities, but it took me uh, 12 years, three agents, 
and those four novels, four and a half novels really, before I actually got published. Um, so what I would say, and the only reason I got that fourth one published was nothing to do with an agent. It was because I entered it into the Mislexia novel competition. Uh, so as you can tell, I'm a big fan of competitions and sending things out and not going by the traditional route of just trusting that an agent is going to do it for you and keep going. Um, so I just wanted to say that to kind of put all those, all those books can be a bit daunting. You think, oh, Rosie Garland, she's got three novels published. Um, and so it's just to put it into perspective. It took me a long time. Um, and yeah, as uh, Megan and the lovely Pepper um, so kindly said, yes, I write lyrics, I write song lyrics, I've written novels, I write poetry, I write short stories, I write um, non-fiction, um, and I write flash fiction, which is teeny weeny stories. Um, and I also write things that fall in the spaces in between and don't really fit. Um, and I guess the short answer to the, that is, um, I don't really fit neatly either. So I guess it's no surprise that my writing doesn't. Um, I'm interested in so much. I, I find the curiosity and the interest in so many things. And I guess that is reflected. Sorry, I am going to wave this book around quite a bit this evening because partly because the cover's so beautiful. Um, and that's reflected in this collection, which contains, well, if I read the blurb, it says it contains uh, the uncanny, magnitudes, magic, feminist, fables, science and astronomy. Um, and there's a wonderful quote from Tova Janssen, she of the Moomin books, who said, never lose interest, never lose your insatiable curiosity. And I love that. So that's me blurbing for a bit. Uh, I am now going to start with a poem and I'm actually going to start with the first poem in What Girls Do in the Dark. Um, it's a poem about rejection because I thought, well, let's get the rejection out of the way right at the beginning. So the only way is up. And uh, I, like all writers and all human beings living on the planet, I have experienced rejection. It's part of the furniture. It's part of the geography. And um, this poem plays around with the idea of like, yeah, I could even get rejected by a black hole. Um, and so this poem is called Letter of Rejection from a Black Hole. We're touched by your desire to join our great work of dismembering the fabric of time and matter. We can't blame you for wanting to hide in nothing and note the ways you've snapped off pieces of yourself to prove you're serious. However, we wonder if you've misunderstood our purpose, the difference between obliteration of the cosmos and the spirit. You've been smothering your radiance for so long it's become a system of belief that you're cored with lead, incapable of anything but borrowed light, or in a destructive twist of logic that impressed the selection panel, brilliance is only permitted to serve others' needs. You have the right to glow. It's not your duty to light up anyone else's day. We urge you to reconsider, wish you well, and suggest steering clear of holes. And uh, one of the strange things about Zoom is um, that was the end of the poem. And there you go, the space. Um, so yes, get the rejection out of the way and uh, let's keep moving. And um, I am going to keep us moving into outer space, into the universe. Um, and uh, I, 
Before I start, I ought to say that I'm not actually a scientist. I'm not even adjacent or neighbour to a scientist. Um, I failed science at school. Um, I failed it in a big way. Um, I did words, not science, and I always thought the two were completely unconnected, and they're not, apparently. Um, and I get, I've got really fascinated by astronomy, maybe because, you know, I've come to it after school. And um, I'm really interested in how weird space is and how strange it is, um, and particularly the edge of our solar system. Uh, for example, Pluto uh, used to be a planet and then it was downgraded to uh, not a planet. And then all the geeks in the world got together and made a big geek fuss. And then it was upgraded to a planet again. Um, and so I was thinking about all these weird objects around Pluto right at the edge of the solar system and um, how it made me think about myself as a kid being weird and on the edge of everything and not fitting. And um, all these weird things at the edge of the solar system are called trans-Neptunian objects, which is the title of my next piece. Way out there between matter and not quite void, they weave in rocky gangs, ragtag remnants of the solar system's sober gathering. They crash each other's parties, spit geezers of methane ice, break the law of what is and isn't planet. They will not kneel in perfect circles round the sun, won't tow any ordered line. There's nouts a queer as Pluto, Sedne, Eris, Thula, Make Make. Shove too far for any naked eye. It only looks like lonely. Faces cratered with a million kisses. Their drunken stagger round the Kuiper belt so leisurely that we have galloped from cave to red button in the time it takes them to notch a handful of orbits. They squint at our blur. We are grit in their eye. Blink, and we're long gone. Thank you very much. That was uh, Transneptunian Objects. So let's move from outer space to something a lot closer to home. Um, and I'm thinking about... Um, myself when I was a kid um, I was an outsider I felt really different I was the I was the weird kid in the school well in my class anyway and uh, that wasn't always easy I have to admit um, and I felt I had to hide so much um, hide so much about myself just in order to get through um, and that leads me neatly to uh, the title poem of the collection which is called What Girls Do in the Dark. And it's about what one sister hides from her other sister. And uh, yes, yeah, so well, I'll just read it. My sister goes missing for nights at a time. She's always home by the time mum bangs on the door and yells at us to get out of bed. So there's no point in telling. Not that I would. I set my clock to wake me at 5 a.m. Her bed's still empty. I almost fall asleep again, but at half past, she comes through the window, gathering her legs beneath her in a crouch and flattening her ears. Mum'll never believe you, she purrs, reeling in her tail. She takes a deep breath and turns her skin the other way so hair is on the inside 
and girl is on the outside. Show me, I say. Her eyes glimmer. When you're ready. I didn't say never. You'll be good at it. But first, stop asking. Thank you again. Um, and for anyone out there who's read The Palace of Curiosities, um, which um, the main character is a young woman who's born completely covered in hair, you may have noticed that I that hairy women do appear in quite a in quite a few of my stories and poems. And now let's change, uh, let's change completely, change track again. Um, uh, one of, I, I don't just write about outer space in terms of what goes on out there in outer space, but um, I'm really interested in connections. I honestly think that everything is connected. And so the idea that science and the big, the big world of quantum mechanics is connected to the inner world, our inner world, our inner space. Um, and that connection between outer space and inner spaces um, and the smaller stories, as well as the big stories is the subject of my next piece. And it's a piece I've never read before. Um, I always like reading out new pieces that I've never read before. and. Um, and this is about the circles that we go around in. I'm sure I'm not the only person to have gone round and round in circles in my life. Um, and I was really fascinated when I discovered that there's this enormous machine. And when I say enormous, it's miles and miles wide um, under the Alps in Switzerland. And it's called the CERN Large Hadron Collider. And it's essentially where a bunch of scientists are working out the size of the universe which sounds really interesting. And they do that by um, basically running electrons for miles in a big circle. And there's your circle connection. And uh, so, and that's the, and I do like a good title. Well, I do like an interesting title and this is the title of the next poem. Since visiting the CERN Large Hadron Collider, you realize what you've been doing wrong with your life. In giant machines beneath the Alps, scientists whack subatomic particles together, smash protons round a loop of magnets to discover something that can only be known by its absence. You've spent a half-life as an experiment in forced collisions, fists, spit, need. Walked into doors you should have slammed behind you, battered your heart in circles, hoping next time it would turn out right. You didn't know there were so many pieces a soul could break into. How love can be conjured by sheer force of wanting. All those shimmery nothings, smaller and smaller specks of self. Atom by atom, you rebuild. Begin to trust what's there, not other people's shooting stars. The future expands the faster you run after in a laughing game of chase me. You've nothing to prove. Leave experiments in destruction to scientists. And uh, yes, I think I've got, um, I'm just checking the time. I think I've got time to read another poem. Yes, got another, um, got time to read another poem. And um, this again, kind of changes direction. Well, no, it doesn't actually, because it's about science still. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I write to ask myself questions. 
um, rather than hammer down answers. Um, that that's something that you know, there was that connection with Angela Carter. Um, she says that she, yeah, you know, when she was writing, she said that she was looking for questions rather than answers. And I guess I I feel kind of similarly. Um, I don't think everything has got an answer, or certainly. I find life much more interesting when I look for questions rather than answers. I like to, and maybe that's again part of the fact that some of my writing is fiction, some is poetry, and some falls in between. Um, I mean, a couple of the pieces I've read tonight um, were, I'm not telling you which ones, but they were first published as flash fiction or creative nonfiction or lyrical essays. And um, so, you know, again, maybe not surprisingly, I'm not quite so bothered about labels as I used to be. I'm far more interested in what's in the jar. Um, and so this is going to be my final poem for this section. Um, and I'm, I'm absolutely delighted and thrilled and proud to say that it was chosen as Guardian Poem of the Week by the wonderful poet Bernice Rumens. And um, it's actually a poem I wrote in memory of my dad, who passed a couple of years ago. And um, I found science gave me a strange comfort that I wasn't expecting after he died, um, namely the first law of thermodynamics that says that none of the energy that's ever existed in the universe ever diminishes or ever increases. There's exactly the same amount of energy in the universe now as there was at the time of the Big Bang. And so this is about my dad, whose energy is still there, here, wherever. And it's called Now That You Are Not You. Now that you are not you and have satisfied the finger check of pulse at throat, and wrist, ear to the chest, mirror to the lips, and you're done with the settle and sigh of blood into the body's pockets, muscles relaxing in their last outstretch, the peat hiccup of the red line becalmed, and your cells are climbing the spine's rope trick up to where the brain is dizzy with electrons, like fireflies stoppered in a jar, and dying is the slow unscrewing of the lid to release your dashing flutter of energies as you unravel, shoot across the universe, in lovely disorganization, going, going, never gone. <laughs> oh, Rosie, thank you so much. They were all brilliant. I was clapping in my silent muted between each one, as I'm sure everybody else was. How wonderful, how moving as well, that last poem. Um, yeah, it's, it's all quite arranged. Um, I'm very much looking forward to asking some questions and also if any of the audience has any questions, please do just yeah. the Q and A box and I will, I will check on them afterwards, but I get to, I get to interrogate you first, Rosie. So, but thank you so much, you read so, so beautifully it's one thing reading them on the page which is an amazing experience it's so different seeing you do them and bring them to life it's really wonderful so thank you rosie um so um i really really love the title of your latest collection what girls do in the dark and as well as the poem that you've just read that we all enjoyed that um inspired it i love them so much it's both what girls do in the dark it's both um sinister and it's playful which I think is true of quite a lot of your writing both in your poetry and your prose 
Um, so I was really interested to know what how important playing is in your creative process. Um, quite a lot, actually. Um, um, yes, I, I suppose I'd better come out as the goth in the room tonight. And I think people have this idea of uh, goths being very miserable and dour. And uh, people who think that clearly aren't hanging out with the right kind of goths. Um, and yeah, so I could, I've talked about the sinister a lot of times, but talking about the play, people don't often ask me about the playful aspect. So thank you. And I guess it takes me back to when I was little, which is where a lot of this starts, let's face it. Um, I don't know about other people here tonight, but I had a dressing up box. Uh, my mum would uh, trawl the local jumble sales um, and charity shops and come home with like armfuls of bits of fabric and old necklaces and petticoats she had a big thing for petticoats I think she wanted me to be the kind of girl who wore lots of petticoats and I did but I usually wore them on my head um and and there's a line in a poem that's not in this collection it's in a previous collection that um talks about how um I could transform myself into a pirate captain a queen a horse you know, the idea that um, I could be anything. I didn't just have to be human even, let alone male or female. Um, so there was me with all these petticoats on my head and it um, taught me something about how you can be a different self when you play or not so much being a different self as discovering how many selves and how many potentialities you have. Um, Walt Whitman, and he was a good poet, um, he had this wonderful and very comforting um, quote, which is, I contain multitudes, which I found very comforting because sometimes the idea that um, there's lots more than just me going on in there can, might feel a bit out of control and a bit scary. But I think the idea that I, I grew up learning how to dress up and this kind of radical flamboyance um, it actually really helped me, you know, with that bit about being an outsider that I said before and how that was tough. Being able to not so much escape, but access those different and happy and flamboyant and pirate queen horse aspects of myself. Um, they really helped me creatively. They really fed me. So, yeah, I th I, and I, th I think it's a tremendous shame that a lot of adults stop dressing up and stop playing um i think it would do us a lot more good if and i think that's one of the reasons why i like goth um is because goths get dressed up and really enjoy it and it's it's not superficial it's actually quite profound um to be a grown-up and get dressed up as a as a um a fellow weird kid at school and also who had definitely had her goth moments in in her time i totally relate um i'm also also i love the idea of a of a queen horse i think i think i think um that sounds amazing um, exactly limit yourself exactly exactly the multitudes are are, are all there um but also in terms of your writing, when, you, when you're actually writing or creative, however you do it, how does play work with that? Do you find yourself, I don't know, I'm always talking to students about the importance of playing, but it's like, it's not, it's, it's um, I think it's more, what I'm more trying to talk to them about is about keeping an open mind and letting your imagination do its job. Um, and, you know, you're, you're, poetry and your prose is so rich you just feel like you have your imaginary worlds well we're in them they don't feel imaginary they're worlds and um I just wanted to know a little bit about that about about your sort of writing process in terms of playing as well um yeah there is quite a bit of um play involved in it um I, play sometimes it, it makes it sound like I'm not taking it seriously or it's a bit of a laugh um or it's this idea of just dashing off a few, you know, it's like, you know, the whole image of the poet as being somebody with a big floofy white shirt who just kind of has a feather quill pen and dashes down a few, a few words and then goes off and drinks absinthe for the rest of the day. And um, so I take my writing very, I might not take myself very seriously, but I do take my writing very seriously. Um, so 
okay, example, um, something I'm doing at the moment because it's really helping me let go and because I think not so much play, um, the way I describe it is it's like getting myself out of the way. And when I say myself, it's this idea of this big sensible, I am a writer, I am now going to sit down and write. And I need to get that person out of the way and let the kid who gets dressed up get hold of the pen and write. And one of the ways I do that is I kind of, kind, I give myself almost a game to play. Um, the wonderful writer Tanya Hirschman does this as well. And um, she's very articulate about um, how she does it. So for example, I'll, I'll do this thing called collisions. I'll open three poetry books and pick out a random line from each. I'll pick a short story and pick out like maybe a line of dialogue. I'll write these down on a piece of paper and then I'll just, my, my task is to write something, doesn't matter what, I don't give it a label, and to try to include those four lines just to get me started. So that's like a game, yeah. that's like playing. And then of course what I'll do, because no plagiarism, thank you very much, I'll strip out those four lines. Yeah. <laughs> but what will often happen while I'm writing, collide, smashing those lines together like electrons by the scientists under the Alps, you see it is all connected, uh, something will happen. Um, just like when you mix together butter and sugar and flour, you end up with a cake. That's science. When you mix up words and you put all these phrases together, you end up with a piece of writing. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that I think that you're so right. And when I said play, I didn't mean I, I, I think we love writing and it's fun, but it's also hard craft. But I think I think what I mean is that kind of um, like you have put it so beautifully, the letting go mm -hmm. aspect of it and the joy of it. And so it's not saying play is frivolous. I would say actually play is one of the most important reasons to be alive, actually. But um, but anyway, that's beside the point. But how? But yes, also talking about um, your latest collection, I was really because a lot of your um, your your prose definitely you've set things in the past and they've been quite historical and you've moved from time into space with this latest collection. There is a lot of um, constellations it's it's lovely and it is playful and it's serious at the same time um so I just wondered what drove you out there into space Rosie um I, I guess I've said some of it already really the idea um of seeing outer space as connected to inner space and um you know I suppose it's <laughs> It's the idea of how to tell those small stories. Um, you know, how do I, you know, like, for example, in that one about um, the CERN Hadron Collider, you know, how do I tell the story of what it's like in a life just to keep going round and round in circles and repeating the same mistakes over and over again, trying to find something that actually isn't there and and, and rather than just saying it like that, which is a bit pedestrian, I want to find a way of saying it. And, and because of the way I make connections in my head, I saw this documentary programme about CERN, which has got a visitor centre. And believe me, I'm going to go to that visitor centre when it opens up again. Um, there's this place called CERN in which literally scientists are discovering something that they don't know is there by whizzing things in circles and it was like this little kind of poo went off in my head and I thought oh, oh, oh going around in circles their science does that too um, and that's why I got excited about comets because there are poems about comets and in, in fact if there's time at the end I might be doing a poem about a comet um, comets go around in circles as well but their circles are weird the circles aren't round and um, they go off in odd directions and Again, that idea of the small story, comets um, get smaller and smaller each time they go round. Um, and so I just see all these connections between the little stories of a human life um, and particularly the circularity um, 
And I guess um, some of it is, you know, some of these, some of the poems in the book are about um, my history. Um, so there's the historical connection yeah. and, uh, and all the kind of mistakes I've made. It's like, I'm sure nobody here tonight has ever made a mistake ever, but <laughs> no, 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 perish the thought. And um, I was very comforted when somebody once said to me, um, you do realize that when you're in your 20s, your 20s are for flailing. Um, that, that really felt very comforting indeed, because I thought, oh, that's okay then. <laughs> because some of the poems are about uh, me doing a lot of flailing and what flailing feels like and how that can feel like everything out of control, like electrons and shooting stars. Yeah. But that makes some sense because um, I do waffle a bit, really. <laughs> no, not at all. You don't at all. You make complete sense. And I just hope flailing is allowed for people who are older than their 22, quite frankly. <laughs> I'm quite yeah. happy to keep flailing. <laughs> well, I'm not happy, but, you know, it'll happen. Um, it <laughs> but looking at, looking at both... Um, well, all your writing really, Rosie, there seems to be a running theme of um, transformation and metamorphosis of things becoming, either revealing their real selves, accepting their real selves, or um, becoming something else. It, it's a metamorph, you know, from your beautiful cats and your lovely um, palace of curiosities girl, um, so it seems to be a, a real thing with you that 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 change that transformation and I I was really interested to know what metamorphosis means to you Rosie um that actually leads on really nicely from the last question um to go from flailing to metamorphosis um because I guess you know if I if if I just stop with the flailing it might sound like I'm a bit hopeless or that life is hopeless, or we, you know, or that just mistakes just keep happening. But I guess metamorphosis for me is about the potential to change. And metamorphosis is a kind of acceptance and a kind of moving from one position to another position, or um, just learning some kind of fluidity. I think I've become a lot happier. Um, since I've accepted a lot of things about myself, you know, growing up as an outsider and being different, um, I used to think there was something wrong with me. You know, that whole idea when I was introducing the poem about um, the sister who turns her skin inside out, you know, I did feel that I had to kind of hide all the uncomfortable sticky out bits of me when I was a kid. And um, I think the metamorphosis thing, which I see as very hopeful and very positive, is that I've come to a place of acceptance where I will turn my skin whatever way I want. You know, I will wear my werewolf hair on the outside, you know. Um, and so metamorphosis does feel positive to me and I think that's one of the reasons why um oh yeah The Night Brother um which was a novel which not giving any spoilers is a novel with a big theme of metamorphosis in it um and family secrets and all those other things that we all live through um and for me it's also um this idea of accepting the fact that I don't fit into neat boxes and the times I've been unhappiest in my life are when I've tried, when I've tried to force myself into other people's boxes, like that line in the um, CERN poem, Other People's Shooting Stars, um, and accepting that I'm never going to fit into a neat mould has actually helped me become much happier. <laughs> Yeah. much much happier and you know you could say that's about um not fitting a binary or you know the fact that my some of my poems don't fit um a neat definition of poem perhaps and that they're hybrid um and that they fall into the spaces in between um and but all of that feels very very positive to me it's not about um 
not coming to a decision, but it's just about, yeah, going with the flow, um, seeing that um, I contain a lot of potentialities and those multitudes that Walt Whitman was talking about. Absolutely. I think hooray for living in the gaps in between, quite frankly. Life never, life never, you're never what you expect you're going to be or what other people expect you're going to be. And that is part of the joy of it, quite frankly, I think. But yeah, wonderfully put, Rosie. So thank, thank you. you. Um, so, but as I know, you know, you've been talking, it does sound like you're very in a very good, happy place at the moment but I know as long as you've had so much brilliant success you're it was so interesting though for you to come out and be so honest about how difficult it was at the beginning which I think a lot of people don't understand with writing they think it's like one day it happens and then it doesn't and suddenly and also probably everybody thinks you're amazingly rich and living this kind of lifestyle because you've got these books with your name in it um, we wish but um, but um but I think you know you've you've done amazing and amazing things with your life but I know you haven't always had it easy um and I, I if you don't mind I wondered if you would um mind telling us a little bit about how some of the tougher times have affected your creativity um well, it's like in mixed ways, really. Um, I mean, I've talked about like, you know, that it was difficult being the weird kid as a kid and um, how it did take me 12 years, three agents and uh, four and a half novels before I got a novel published. Um, also, keep sending things out, folks. Keep entering competitions. I'll say that a lot. Um, somebody out there loves your work, but they have to see it and they won't if it's under your bed. Anyway, that's that's my um, that's my rant um yeah you know uh life has thrown a lot of curveballs at me and um and i've survived them i guess that's the thing i'm a survivor uh i'm i mean yeah those of you who know me or who've read the, the front page on my website because again i don't keep it a secret um in 2009 um i was diagnosed with throat cancer and um, believe me, that wasn't on my to-do list. Um, I've never been a smoker. I drink a laughably small amount of alcohol. So this was absolutely out the blue. And um, thank you, NHS, um, because without the NHS, I probably wouldn't be sitting here talking to you tonight. Um, and I got lots of treatment. People were wonderful. And I'm one of the very lucky ones. And I know that it's a disease that not everyone gets through. And I'm tremendously grateful to the NHS and the wonderful people who took care of me that I'm still here. And, um, and I don't know, I don't, I don't think it's connected, but my writing and my creativity turned on a dime after I recovered, um, it was, it's almost like my life's in two parts, like what I call BC, before cancer, and after. Um, my writing has changed. Um, I mean, I think it's maybe too simplistic to say it's got better, but I don't know, maybe I just dropped something. Maybe I let go of stuff I was hanging on to. Maybe I just thought, well... Um, for heaven's sake, if not now, when? You know, do it now. It was um, after I recovered from cancer that I sent my novel that became Palace of Curiosities into the Mislexia novel competition. And I'm not saying I would never have done that, but I had been basically sitting around waiting for an agent, one of my three agents, to sort out a novel deal for me for 12 years. And I mean, why was I sitting around? Why didn't I just do it myself? And um, I don't know if the two are connected, but after I'd recovered from cancer, it was just like, let's do this thing. And the that's rest fantastic. is history. Um, and I you know, hope that's okay to say that because sometimes people find it a bit difficult when people talk about illness because not everyone gets through this. And I'm really respectful 
of people's no, feelings. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh-huh. no, I totally know what you're saying, Rosie. But it's it's. I think it's just like it's a human, like any human experience. It's it's yeah. you know one way for some people, another way for other people, and and like you say, you get lucky with the cards you're dealt. Um, thank you, the NHS, that the way things worked out for you worked out for you. But yeah, obviously, not every bad experience has a shiny happy ending, and I don't think any of us are saying that but um no, but really it's just interesting that that um it is just interesting the way that it 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 you know the way that you absorb and change with that another almost another metamorphosis <laughs> going on absolutely it what well, it did feel like a metamorphosis in terms of like you know what I just let go of and um you know it felt that I I don't know just got this absolute reminder of like we are here for such a short amount of time you know there's nothing like getting a sneak preview at your sell by date to really concentrate the mind wonderfully and just think oh let's just get on with this in a positive yeah. way you know in a really really positive way yeah 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 that's amazing um I know we've got a few, th- a, a couple of questions, but just before we go to them, Rosie, I'll ask you my last question before we go oh. and have a look, look in the Q and A. Um, I just like to know what you're working on now and what's coming next from Rosie Garland. Uh, well, I have been um, over the past year. Let's uh, use the C word, COVID. Um, over the past year, I have been working on um, writing some flash fiction. And I'm also working on a new novel, um, which, um, watch this space, um, but I am working on a new novel and it is a novel about haunting. So it still has that sort of like uncanny feel about it, but we shall see. Um, Something else I'm doing, which I'm really excited about is the wonderful people at Nine Arches have invited me to um, start a poetry reading group uh, particularly an LGBTQ poetry reading group um, particularly based for people in the West Midlands and uh, the lovely Pippa at Five Leaves is going to put my email address into the chat feature and if anyone would like to come and find out more about the poetry reading group it's going to be um, online um, to start with and it's going to be for five sessions and it's free and really you don't have to write anything it's about enjoying and reading poetry um, and discovering some new stuff if you are poetry curious so it's for poetry curious yeah so um, my email is in the chat feature come and chat to me come and talk to me that sounds fantastic Rosie that's so lovely it's you know all us writers love our reading as well. It's what a joy, what a joy. But I'm going to have a little look in the Q&A. So mm-hmm. uh, this is from Rachel Phillips. Does the weirdness of science and space particularly appeal to you? I mean, the way things don't actually behave as we think slash know they should, which to me is quite bizarre and endlessly fascinating. Well, uh, Rachel has absolutely put her finger on it. I love the way that um, outer space doesn't behave. I mean, that's it. You've said it better than I ever could do. Um, I love the way that, um, as I was saying about those trans-Neptunian objects, they don't behave. They made me think about punks, the way that punks don't behave. And, you know, finding that there are these tiny planets right on the edge of the solar system that have got enormous geysers, but they're of solid methane. And um, nobody was expecting one of the moons of Jupiter to be one of the hottest, most active planets, planetary bodies in the solar system. Wherever you go in space, there's a surprise. One of the biggest surprises, and it's absolutely lovely, if you go onto Google Images and Google Pluto, They've just finally managed, oh, about a year ago, they took the close, close-up close photos of Pluto. And there's this huge crater on the side of Pluto that's the shape of a heart. You couldn't make it up. You really couldn't. So, yeah, disobedient planets. I'll drink to that. Oh, fabulous. Um, 
I've got always got a question from Dorothy Kerpanik. Sorry, Dorothy, I've said your surname wrong, I'm sure. Um, she's asking, do you have an agent now? But she, it's probably a bit more of a general question, like how you manage your writing now, really, Rosie, and how yeah. you, yeah. I do actually have an agent now, and she's wonderful, um, because I guess those earlier agents I had just didn't understand me or didn't believe in me. And the important thing, if you are going to get an agent, it doesn't matter who they are, except they need to believe in you, um, because that's the important thing. In terms of how I manage my writing, my agent deals with my novels. Um, in terms of poetry, um, I know there are some people who do have poetry agents, but I don't. I deal with all my poetry myself. Um, I send it out to magazines and journals. Um, I sent out um, poems to Nine Arches when they had one of their open submission periods. Um, check their website because they have an open submission period, I think twice a year. And I sent the poems in that became this book and they were accepted. So I do all of that myself. Um, the same with flash fiction or really short stories. I deal with all that myself. I send it out. Um, I make connections with other writers. I'm doing some paired writing with another short story writer at the moment. So we're trading ideas online with each other because that's the other thing about writing. It's lonely. It's you in a room on a chair with a computer usually or a book um, and finding any form of community or connection, whether that's a reading group or a writing group, it's really important. It's fantastically important. So that's another way I keep my writing together as well. I make connections with people. Oh, I totally echo that. I think finding other people, because it's a mad old world we live in as writers and you need other writers to understand that because, you know, we live with these made up people in these made up places, um, you know, thinking about things that, you know, with all our connections and everything else. And sometimes you need other people who will understand exactly that angle of bonkers you're coming from, which makes complete sense to you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Megan and particularly this last year has been particularly isolating so now more than ever events like this or writing groups and reading groups where you can connect with people online this they remind us just how important those connections and community are definitely definitely I've got a bit of a practical um Oh, a practical question and a not so practical question, both from Nikki Hasty. Hello, Nikki. Um, do you have to be in the West Midlands to take part in the poetry reading group? That is the theory. Um, it is. Um, it, the funding has come for the West Midlands, but um, but talk to me. <laughs> we might have to drag you over to the East Midlands, Rosie. We might need you over here too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the Nikki also asks, she just wants to inquire after the welfare of Rosie Lagozzi and is much music making going on in your lives? Um, not so much music over the past year, I will admit. And uh, yes, I do do a sort of like cabaret, flam you know, I still do my dressing up because I do love my dressing up and I dress up as a flamboyant cabaret character called Rosie Lugosi, the Vampire Queen. And I'll just leave that all to your imaginations. And of course, um, being locked down um, pretty much for a year and a bit, um, there hasn't been very much opportunity to get out there and sing cabaret. But the doors will open soon. So, uh, but I have been doing lots of writing, just not very much singing, unfortunately. Oh, well, I hope um, Rosie Lugosi visits Nottingham, but also really, really, really would love Rosie Garland to visit Nottingham. So come and see us. Come and see us soon. Um, I'm just checking which. Uh, yeah, we've, I think so. I think we're nearly at our end. Um, I, I want I would like to leave a bit of time for you to read us something else Rosie before we go but before you do that I'd just like to say an absolutely massive thank you to you for being here thank you to Five Leaves obviously and Pippa um, but I, it's been a joy to chat to you and it's been fascinating and um, 
yeah, I'm caught, yeah, really excited about what's coming next and um, what girls do in the dark. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Everyone needs to get a copy. So <laughs> thank you very much, Rosie. And um, what a pleasure. Thank you. And, and so I need you. to lead us out. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, the lovely Pippa from Five Leaves is putting a fabulous link so that you can buy this book. Um, and I am going to end on a note of hope. And uh, because, uh, yeah, we started with the rejection and we're going to end with hope and, uh, and also a comet and also a dog, because who doesn't love a dog? And this is called Biography of a Comet in the Body of a Dog. All flap and gallop off the leash. It careers in a wild orbit round the solar system. The sweep of its tail makes skittles of doubt. It digs holes through the wounded parts of joy to the other side of despair. Every time I toss hope away, it brings it back, drops it at my feet, tongue drooling a glittering rope. On cinder nights when breath knocks hollow breath, it soars, heart on fire, chasing squirrel stars it can never catch. <laughs>